Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Serwer. I'm the director of the Conflict Management Program, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this 17th edition of the of CISA's Conflict Management Study Trip, a series Bill Zartman initiated with a trip to Haiti in 2006. This year's study trip course, and it is a course, visited Riyadh and Doha, focusing on what both seem to accept calling the GCC conflict. We undertake these trips each year, sometimes twice a year, with two convictions. There just is no substitute for understanding what generates conflict and how it can be healed. Peace comes through in understanding. Understanding depends in part on talking directly with people involved, in addition to intense readings and briefings by observers. We've been blessed in many ways this academic year. We had terrific briefers in the fall, including General Anthony Zinni, who was then the US mediator for this conflict, Joost Hilterman, Hussein Ibish, Brian Seagraves of the US Department of Defense, and former ambassador to Qatar, Patrick Theros. We were also privileged to talk with the ambassadors of the state of Qatar, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, each of whom represented his country with conviction and intelligence. Then in January, we undertook a 10-day trip to the region which was likewise replete with terrific briefings and discussions. I can't possibly name all our interlocutors, but they are listed in the, uh, in the published volume of student essays with an introduction by Professor Zartman and conclusions by me that will be available to you when you leave. I must, however, thank the prime organizers of our meetings the Education Ministry of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in Riyadh, and the Gulf International Forum in Doha. Both governments, as well as the think tanks, universities, journalists, and others in both capitals were extraordinarily generous with their time, thoughts, and friendship. So what did we find? As you're about to hear, we found the Gulf in the Gulf is profound but not unbridgeable. The GCC conflict is a non-hurting stalemate, but one with big impacts throughout the Middle East. Our student speakers will be reviewing their findings in what you are about to hear, including lots of recommendations for confidence-building measures, dialogue and mediation, in addition to continuing military and counterterrorism cooperation. But until and unless the leaders and people of the Gulf decide to end their stalemate, it isn't likely to happen. We all hope they will opt for peace before the real hurting starts. Let me... Uh, tell you about how we'll proceed. Rebecca John will start us off discussing the roots of the conflict based on her own essay about narratives, as well as Patrick Maclis's on family politics and Julia Wargo's on public relations strategies. Then Sarah Aver will lead us into efforts at resolution based on her own analysis of the reasons for the deadlock in negotiations Sabiha Khan's account of the so far failed mediation efforts, and Jasmine Choi's on whether failure is in fact an option. Then Ashley Curtis will talk about the economic and regional impacts of the GCC conflict, including Aditya Balu's analysis of the Qatar-Iran-Turkey triangle, which has been strengthened, Danielle Martin on US military relations, and Dennis Murphy on the fragmentation that is both the cause and effect of the GCC conflict. After that, uh, 
We'll uh, open the floor uh, to Professor Zartman, who will conclude, and to Q&A from you. Rebecca, either way. Okay. Oh, do I have to turn this on? Or it's on? Press on. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, so, first of all... Um, on behalf of the group, I just wanted to thank everyone who made the trip possible, um, especially to Professor Sora and Zartman um, for what was uh, really an incredible opportunity. Um, and of course to Isabel, who not only helped organize the trip, um, but compiled uh, the report, and also for organizing uh, what I hope will be a fantastic event this afternoon. Um, firstly, I wanted to give a little bit of an impression of the trip. Um, so before we left, there was a degree of apprehension about going. Uh, so obviously Saudi Arabia was in the news a lot at the end of last year. Uh, some of us received a fair amount of, of questioning and indeed criticism uh, for going to the region. Um, also particularly for the women in the group. Uh, we really just didn't know what to expect. And I think by the end, we all agreed that um, we, were, we were pleasantly surprised by our experience and it confounded many of our stereotypes about the region. Uh, everyone we met was incredibly warm and hospitable. Um, to give you an example, uh, a group of students uh, from King Saud University in Riyadh invited us to their homes for dinner and, and put on a lavish, lavish feast. Um, so, and overall, it was just a really fascinating experience. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the region is currently undergoing some significant changes. And it was just really interesting to, to experience some of that and to talk to people on the ground about it. Um, also, again, as, as a group, um, I think we didn't stop talking about the trip the entire time that we, that we were there, sort of in between meetings, uh, in the cars, at breakfast, at lunch, at dinner. It was kind of pretty relentless, actually. Um, but to the conflict, um, so I think all of us were very much struck um, by the which both the Saudis and Qataris presented their side of the conflict. Um, so I think it's something that's often portrayed as a family squabble, um, but it soon became apparent that this was not the case. And what Julia, Patrick, and myself have tried to do uh, in our reports is to unpack some of these narratives and to really try and get at the roots of the conflict. Um, so first of all, I'm going to outline the grievances. Slide. Ah. <laughs> um. Okay. So from um, uh, so from Saudi Arabia and the quartet, um, what we heard was was that obviously Qatar is is accused of supporting terrorism, uh, which they claim threatens the security and stability of the region. Uh, in particular, they are unhappy with uh, Qatar's relationship with, with the Muslim Brotherhood, which, of course, uh, were banned, uh, were sort of made uh, designated terrorist organizations in the UAE, Saudi, and Egypt after the Arab Spring. But we heard about other groups, too, including Hamas and Al-Qaeda. Uh, something else that they're particularly unhappy with is the content of Al Jazeera uh, and the claim that it provides a platform to extremists. Um, we also heard a lot about Qatar's close relationship with Iran, which is Saudi Arabia's re regional rival and uh, increasingly Turkey. Uh, from the Qatari side, uh, it of course uh, denies supporting terrorism. Um, it does not deny supporting elements of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, but it claims that where the Muslim Brotherhood has gained popular support, uh, such as in Egypt after the Arab Spring, um, it views them as a legitimate political movement, and its support uh, reflects the will of the people. Uh, from their side, they accuse Saudi Arabia in particular of not respecting their sovereignty and also their desire to pursue an independent foreign policy. They also highlighted the social cost of the blockade, uh, including the family separation and uh, Qataris not being able to travel to Hajj and Umrah. Um, they, there were also some suggestions that perhaps other countries in the region uh, were jealous of, of Qatar's success, in particular uh, with things like the uh, 2022 World Cup. Uh, something else that was very interesting was some of the language that was used. So, for example, from Saudi Arabia, we had a lot of, of things like uh, light versus dark, good versus evil, and, and fears of an Islamist alliance, uh, a sort of axis of evil, if you will, between uh, Iran, uh, Turkey, and, and Qatar. 
Um, there was a lot of talk of Qatar's backwardness uh, versus Saudi Arabia's progressiveness. Uh, and we also heard a lot about uh, the reforms that are happening at the moment, in particular Vision 2030. And by contrast, Qatar uh, insisted that it was the most progressive of the Gulf states. They highlighted their role as the sort of culture and, and educational leader in the region. Again, obviously, we heard a lot about the, the World Cup. And then in terms of the crisis, uh, again, some of the language was, was interesting. Uh, the Qataris generally described it as a blockade. Uh, we heard even that it was an act of war. Um, there was also a kind of general sense that everyone woke up on the 5th of June 2017 and suddenly found themselves cut off. Um, for the quartet, on the other hand, uh, they generally refer to it as a boycott um, and that they had sort of simply chosen not to deal with Qatar. And just a note on terminology in the report, uh, we have decided to uh, use the more neutral uh, embargo. Um, so that brings me to where we are today. No? Aha. Um, uh, so obviously, as, as the title of the report suggests, uh, there is a stalemate. Um, but what is particularly notable is that rhetoric and attacks uh, between the two sides have become increasingly personal. Um, outside observers have spoken to us about a culture of hate. Um, as Julia discusses in, in her report, uh, both governments have attempted to weaponize public opinion against the other. So in, in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, we've seen anti-Qatari children's songs, uh, pop songs, including, for example, Teach Guitar, for which the lyrics are, teach guitar and those who stand behind it that our country is patient. But when matters escalate and become dangerous, you'll see the actions of its men. Uh, there's also been court poetry, uh, in addition to attacks in both traditional and social media, uh, and the use of bots and trolls on Twitter. Both sides have engaged in a PR war. Um, the governments have spent millions of dollars on lobbying, particularly here in DC. And finally, again, something that's really interesting is, is that there's been a sort of cult of personality and also in increased displays of nationalism on both sides. So in Saudi, uh, among the people that we met in Riyadh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman is very popular, especially among the young. Uh, in Qatar, there's a sense that Sheikh Tamim has become uh, the personification of resistance. Um, so the image, the, the lower image there, um, which is known as Tamim is Glory. Um, this image is, you see it on skyscrapers everywhere in Doha, but also uh, in shop windows, in cars, uh, etc. Uh, so how did we get here? Um, so I wanted to highlight a couple of key events that I think are, are crucial for, for understanding the crisis. Um, the first of which uh, is the, the 1995 coup in Qatar. Um, so Sheikh Hamad um, overthrew his father, Sheikh Khalifa, in a bloodless coup. And this is something that Patrick discusses uh, in more detail in his report. Um, but what's important to note is that prior to this, uh, Qatar had a relatively uh, close relationship with Saudi Arabia, and their foreign policies were more or less aligned. Uh, in Doha, we heard of a deep resentment um, over Qatar's subservience to Saudi Arabia uh, during this period. Um, after the coup, uh, Hamad uh, pursued an independent, an independent foreign policy, uh, and one that could almost be described as kind of deliberately uh, distinguishing itself from Saudi Arabia's. Um, and then depending on whose side you're on, after 1995, Qatar either became independent or became maverick. Uh, Hamad has also been the driver for Qatar's growth over the last 25 years. Uh, so this has included the uh, development of LNG production, um, which of course has seen Qatar become one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, we've also seen the rise of Doha as a tourist destination. And needless to say, Hamad is not very popular in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, then I think the most uh, important uh, event is the 2011 Arab Spring. Um, with the exception of Bahrain, although the Gulf was sort of relatively less affected, uh, compared to um, some of the turmoil that we saw elsewhere in the Middle East. Um, the events were nevertheless unnerving, particularly to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of important things to highlight, or so, some important outcomes of the Arab Spring. Uh, so one of which is that uh, it opened up space uh, for Iran to extend its influence in the region, and we've seen an increase in tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran since then. 
Um, we've also seen the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood and other um, Islamic political organization. Um, and, and what's really key and, and what uh, was uh, particularly unfathomable to, to the quartet was Qatar's response. Um, I think Qatar saw it as an opportunity to increase its reach uh, in the region. Um, there was a lot of criticism of the coverage of Al Jazeera given to the Arab Spring. Um, so at some point, for example, uh, Al Jazeera in Egypt was seen as the enemy of the state. Um, but Qatar was also seen as, as supportive to, to groups like the Brotherhood, uh, particularly uh, in Egypt. And this is something I go into detail uh, in, in my report. Um, but I also wanted to note that post-Arab Spring, um, political Islam is seen as something of an existential threat to the Gulf monarchies. Um, as one of our interlocutors in Saudi Arabia put it, allegiance should be to the state, not to the caliphate. Um, we also have the 2014 agreement, uh, which was uh, an agreement between Qatar and Saudi Arabia not for Qatar not to interfere with or undermine Saudi Arabia, um, which according to the Saudis, Qatar allegedly broke within a few months. Um, and then we have obviously the rise of Mohammed bin Salman and then uh, the election of Trump. And there is some speculation that Trump gave a uh, green light to Riyadh to go ahead with the embargo. So in terms of understanding the conflict, I think uh, the key takeaway um, for us is, is that it's really important to understand some of the historical and, and social aspects uh, behind this. And also that it is a, a very much a multi-layered conflict that reflects um, different issues. Uh, so for example, we see uh, insecurity. Um, domestically, this includes uh, domestic challenges such as uh, high youth unemployment, particularly in Saudi Arabia, uh, declining energy prices, um, and fear of political or indeed uh, ideological opposition. We also see insecurity on a regional level. Um, so uh, uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, fear of Iran um, and I think it should be noted that um, th there's kind of a difference in threat perception. So where Iran is a big threat to Saudi Arabia, this is not the case for, for Qatar, or at least not to the same extent. Uh, we also see competition. Uh, we see this on a domestic level in terms of uh, family relations. Uh, we see it on a regional level, uh, again, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but increasingly Turkey. And then we also see it between uh, the leaders, so of course MBS and uh, Sheikh Tamim. Um, and another interesting angle to this, I think, is also identity. Um, identity in the Gulf exists across many levels, so you see it on a familial level, a tribal level, national level, also a, a sort of Gulfi or Khaliji level. Uh, and some of the people that we spoke to suggested that there was sort of an erosion of the social fabric and that we're seeing just sort of increased nationalism and sort of state building. Um, and I think what you have is, is sort of a perfect storm of, of all of these different factors. So where do we go from here? Um, so for Julia, Patrick and I, our, our focus is on, on, on dialogue and getting the two parties around the table. We would encourage bilateral discussions uh, between Riyadh and Doha. We also think there's a need to go beyond the 13 demands. Uh, so for example, to discuss different threat perceptions. Uh, we think Saudi Arabia needs to send a clear message that it respects Qatar's sovereignty, uh, while Qatar should demonstrate that its intentions in the region are not to undermine or destabilize Saudi Arabia. I should also highlight that there has been a serious breakdown of trust uh, between the two sides. Uh, and therefore, we emphasize trust and confidence building measure, measures um, that we think also there could be some flexibility on the 13 demands. Uh, so this could include an editorial shift in Al Jazeera, the development of transparency initiatives, including third party monitoring of media or finances, and then potentially lifting some of the more stringent parts of the embargo, which would allow Qataris to travel freely for Hajj and Umrah um, or for families to, to visit each other. Um, and finally, I, I think that um, what's key is that the, the two sides should focus on what unites them rather than what divides them. Uh, something we heard a lot of in both Riyadh and Doha uh, was that these countries share deep um, cultural and social ties. Um, everyone we spoke to said they had a cousin or an aunt or, or someone they knew in, in either Saudi or, or um, in Qatar. 
Um, and so we think potentially there's room for civil society and perhaps religious leaders to step in to try and, and heal divisions. Um, and then also that they could actually work together on political and social change in the Gulf. Um, both countries face similar challenges and we think that there's no reason why one country's developments may not be positive for the other. Thank you. Um, so now I would like to expand upon some of the elements that Rebecca mentioned, especially looking at uh, prospect of negotiation. So as we've seen, um, efforts to date to solve the conflict have not been successful. We've seen the Emir of Kuwait, who has failed to mediate the conflict, as well as the U.S. Special Envoy, uh, General Anthony Zinni, who has resigned. So we try, we try to understand why did they fail and what the prospect was to say for success are. Um, before, before going to the trip, we, we met with a number of experts in D.C., ambassadors, and we got a very pessimistic perspective on the conflict and how it's unlikely for the conflict to be resolved. And as a result, as we were conducting our meetings um, in, in both Doha and Riyadh, we, we had this in the back of our mind, and as a result, we were looking for pieces of information that um, could indicate that um, you know, um, resolution and common ground can be found. Uh, as we were trying to understand so why external actors are failing to mediate the conflict, we pretty quickly came to the conclusion that it was mainly because parties have no incentive to negotiate. Uh, both economies have managed to cope with the crisis pretty successfully. Uh, on, on the one hand, we have Qatar, which um, often refers to the crisis as being a, a blessing in disguise, and which, ha which has uh, helped Qatar to diversify its economy, as well as uh, boosting some of his social reforms. And on the other hand, we have the quartet, so Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt, uh, which are not suffering so much in terms of trade and, and foreign investment. Um, so as a result, we're in a situation where uh, none of the parties are feeling the pain, uh, both economically and politically, which translate into um, a lack of incentive to negotiate. The only one who, uh, who are probably suffering are the citizens on both sides who are um, facing issues with family reunifications, issues with, um, with travel and travel, res um, travel restrictions. Um, but it seems that citizen suffering uh, are not enough for the leadership to, to move to negotiation, and as long as the leadership itself is not heard directly, uh, they are not willing to, to move. Um, and in that context, given the lack of leadership, uh, the, the lack of pain uh, for the leadership, it's extremely difficult to picture how the, the conflict can be solved. Jasmine Choi uh, Choi had a very interesting perspective by making a distinction between traditional Arab Islamic processes of conflict resolution and uh, Western techniques. She explains how uh, traditional Arab Islamic uh, processes of conflict resolution, which is called uh, Sula, is centered around a third party actor uh, called Jaha. And uh, this, the Jaha, the third party actor, is often played by the, the, the eldest and the longest uh, serving figure in the region. And in, in that sense, Jasmine argues that uh, Qatar attempted to play that role of, of the Jaha, of the third party actor, but failed because of uh, each, each effort was um, spoiled by the unwillingness of the party to negotiate. And on the other hand, the Western approach, which is, which is uh, centered around a win-win scenario and trying to find incentive uh, to push the party to the table, uh, has also failed. And so Jasmine concludes that both the Western and the traditional Arab Islamic approach uh, have failed to solve the crisis so far. So we're now in this very difficult situation in which parties have reached a stalemate, a non-hurting stalemate, um, and where the conflict is, is moving towards uh, intractability. 
And one of the big problems we, we, we quickly understand uh, was that the quartet was expecting Qatar to uh, capitulate to their demands. But if Qatar is perceiving the conflict as being a blessing in disguise, there is no reason for Qatar to go and negotiate. And with the, you know, by conducting meetings, we got the impression that the current status quo is perceived as preferable than um, an agreement. And that is quite concerning to the extent that the conflict is being normalized in the region uh, and is now becoming the, the new status quo. Uh, Sabiha can adds, a, adds also an interesting point um, by saying that one of the most concerning element of intractability is the question of identity. Um, identity, I mean, she observed uh, the emergence of a separate Qatari identity, which can possibly take hold between uh, Saudis um, and Qataris, making the environment even more challenging to find common ground between all the parties. Uh, it's now been almost two, two years since the announcement of the of the boycott and human interactions between the two parties have been drastically reduced. And as a result, trust and fears of the other actions, um, as well as um, capabilities and intention of the other side um, has drastically increased. Uh, on top of that, as Rebecca mentioned, we um, conflicting narratives are also playing a, a, an important role by um, creating this and um, preventing peace talks. Um, each other are accusing the other side of attempting uh, coup and uh, undermining each other royal families as well as financing terrorism in the region. And as a result, potential for resolution is becoming really difficult to picture. Um, one of the biggest paradox of, of the conflict is is that while all parties are um, perceiving the other action as existential threats, none of, none of them are, feel the sense of urgency to solve it. And even among peers, we do not agree and we still do not agree on how to solve the conflict. We do not agree on what should be done uh, to move the party towards resolution. Um, Sabia Ken argues for a Kuwaiti mediation Jasmine Choi's argue for uh, U.S. mediation, and uh, our, I argue for uh, no mediation at all. The only thing we could, uh, the only thing we could uh, agree on was uh, how much leverage the U.S. has in the region. The U.S. is by far the the more important uh, um, important provider of military supplies. It has obviously the U.S. base in Qatar and has long-standing relationship with Saudi Arabia as well. Um, so the differences in our policy recommendation differs in the extent of how much or the extent to which the U.S. should get involved or not. So Sabi Haken conc uh, concludes um, that a Kuwait mediation is preferable. She also argued, argues for a U.S. backing for a small-scale mediation which will allow the party to move towards and past their positional demands and move and avoid a slide towards uh, deeper intractability. Uh, she also points out how uh, a Kuwaiti mediation could formulate a face-saving solution for both the part for both of the parties. Um, another perspective is the one of Jasmine. Jasmine Shois argues for a U.S. mediation. Um, she takes a more pessimistic approach, uh, even questioning the possibility of solving the conflict itself within the region. Um, but she argues that with the right amount of pressure from coming from the U.S., that could move the party towards, I mean, to the negotiation table. She also um, she also mentions how the U.S. can benefit from it and how it's in the U.S. interest to do that in order to maintain the stability and the cohesion in the region, and as well as dealing with uh, the fear of Iranian domination over the Middle East. Uh, finally, I, I argue that third-party mediation will not solve the conflict. Um, that's what we've seen. 
the Emir of Kuwait failed, the U.S. Special Envoy resigned, um, and because of the deep-rooted issues in this conflict, uh, this conflict requires direct talks between the party, and this is not a third-party mediator who will come and, and solve it for them. Uh, however, that being said, the U.S. can get involved and, and has definitely enough leverage to pressure the parties to engage. Uh, but the U.S. would have more of a role of support and facilitation. Uh, this role can take different forms that can be um, holding the talks outside the conflicting countries in order to assure a more neutral ground that could be um, helping the parties defining the timelines and their roadmap, as well as helping them establishing mechanism um, to um, implement and verify the, the agreements. Or finally, that can also help helping them coordinate uh, confidence building measures. So although we've proposed different means by which a resolution can be found, the most important takeaway is that we all agree that uh, action can be taken to solve the conflict. Whereas we came in with a very pessimistic uh, view of the, of the crisis, we left the Middle East with uh, the sense that a resolution is possible. So thank you, and I'll cede my time to Ashley. So I will be presenting um, the research done by myself, uh, Aditya Balu, Danielle Martin, and Dennis Murphy. I've broken it into two uh, separate categories. Um, my research in Adi's focuses on uh, the economic components, while Dennis and Danielle's focus is on military. So when we look at an analysis of the effectiveness of the embargo based on monetary and fiscal indicators, we see that Qatar has um, weathered the storm quite well. Um, indeed, in, according to um, what Sarah alluded to, a lot of the representatives that we met with in Qatar actually said that it was uh, that it had strengthened their economy. And the critical reason for that is because Qatar wanted to diversify the economy um, for a couple of years now. What the cut, what the crisis has done is acted as a catalyst so that they could make ten years worth of progress towards that goal in one year. Um, they, prior to the, to the crisis, they imported almost all of their food um, and all of their goods, but now as they have been forced um, to diversify do their domestic production, they are doing more and more of that themselves. They also allude to the fact that they have more uh, diverse trade partners, which makes them more stable as they're not as beholden on um, just one or two partners in UAE or um, Saudi Arabia. Um, and indeed, they have a they have signed a new trade agreement between um, Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry, between uh, Qatar, Turkey, and Iran. Um, so the the indicators all suggest that Qatar has been very resilient. Um, that is the narrative, uh, a substantiated narrative by um, the Qatari representatives that we met with. But there are also indicators of weakness that they have indeed experienced some pain. Um, right after the beginning of the crisis, there was a capital outflow. So all of many of the foreign investors began taking all of their money out of um, Qatari bank accounts. Now, they were, this had the potential to cause a, a severe banking crisis, but because the Qatari central bank had so many reserves, it was able to replace all of the private money that had left with pri private sector, with public sector goods and, and, um, and deposits. However, even though they were able to uh, avoid that banking crisis, it still depleted their resource, their reserves, and it increased the risk premium that they now must pay to foreign investors who are putting their money in Qatar. Um, in addition to this, while Qatar is still experiencing positive economic growth, it has slowed the process of that, and it has slowed the trajectory that it was on. So the major takeaway from this is that although there's not uh, acute pain that would compel Qatar to comply with all of the demands of the quartet countries, it has nonetheless caused discomfort on Qatar's part. Some of the reasons for the stalemate uh, and the economic components of that stalemate are uh, the LNG exports from Qatar. Uh, 
So the Saudi Arabian representatives we met with were, were quick to, di- to specify that they were not placing a blockade on Qatar. They were simply boycotting. And in line with that, they did not cut off Qatar's ability to export LNG. Now, UAE export is a huge importer of this LNG, and they are highly dependent upon it for at least 50% of their electricity. So they didn't have the um, latitude to do that, nor did they want to cross the threshold of what they would consider um, a declaration of war. Because Qatar has been able to continue exporting um, their LNG, they've had the resources necessary to cushion the blow of the economic um, burdens that have been placed upon them. Um, Another reason, as we alluded to earlier, is the diversification. Um, A lot of the representatives that we met with were told us about an anecdote about how Qatar had flown hundreds of cows from the United States on Qatar Air to... 3,000, 3,000, um, in order to create a domestic dairy industry. So those are some fun pictures of <coughs> cows on uh, commercial airplanes. So um, this just goes to show that they're, they've taken a lot of pride in the domestic industries that they've been able to de- develop. We also noticed, both in speaking with individuals and in commercial areas, that there's a lot of pride in the Made in Qatar movement. So you go into stores and you don't see made in cutter just on the back of products, but you see it on the front of t-shirts and on the front of necklaces and that kind of thing. So they're, they're very proud of this, and um, that's part of the reason that they have been able to withstand the economic impacts of the embargo. Um, the third reason, which has already also been uh, alluded to, are the, the 13 demands that the, the quartet countries place upon Qatar um, as contingent for removing the uh, embargo. In order for economic statecraft to be effective, the repeal has to be tied to actionable, realistic action items. Because the 13 demands were so onerous and they actually cut to the very identity and security of Qatar, they are set up for failure from the start. Representatives from the UN and from other Western countries have said that um, the the quartet has to offer more realistic demands if they want any kind of movement. And the representatives from Qatar said that they don't believe that the quartet actually wants to negotiate because these demands are so onerous and that they are proof that the quartet just wants to isolate them. Um, So the outcome has has been um, a relative lack of pressure from the economic uh, uh, cessation of relations between the, between the countries. Qatar has made some changes to combat extremism, which um, the Saudi Arabian representatives have attributed to the uh, effectiveness of the embargo. Before 2018, and tw- before the embargo was put in place, Qatar would not sign an MOU to combat extremism with the United States. But since 2008, they've been willing to work more collaboratively and have signed that MOU. So while they have made some progress, the quartet is still unsatisfied with the progress that they have been willing to um, put forward. Um, in terms of I- outcome, there have also been significant regional impacts. Um, it has The embargo has pushed Qatar closer to Iran because of the air airspace embargo that the quartet countries have placed upon it. Instead of being able to fly Qatar Airways over um, Saudi Arabia or the UAE or Bahrain, they now have to divert all of these planes through Iranian airspace. And so there's been a number of agreements uh, of cooperation that have happened on that front with Iran. Um, It has also pushed Qatar closer to Turkey specifically in military relations. Two days after the embargo was put in place, the Turkish parliament passed um, resolutions that put more Qatari troops on on the ground in Qatar. Um, and so that has been a, a, a significant development in those, those countries' relationships as well. Um, so the major takeaway from these observations are that cooperation with Iran and Turkey have now been well established and are likely to endure regardless of whether or not the embargo is retracted. Um, our recommendations are, number one, that the quartet should re- reform its demands to be less onerous. And based on our conversations that we had with both sides, the a good place to start would be to reform the editorial board of Al Jazeera to make 
Al Jazeera Arabic less incendiary. It was an area in which um, the quartet said that their needs would be met under those circumstances and which Qatar said that those are concessions they would be willing to make. So that's a, a really good place to, to start instead of with the 13 demands. Um, another recommendation uh, is that Qatar should show willingness to begin talks under some preconditions. They have made preconditions a non-starter for neg negotiations because they are um, very defensive of their independent foreign policy, um, but without willing, without any willingness to accept even nominal pre preconditions, there will be no dialogue and nothing will be able to progress. So I now move on to the military components of this conflict. Um, although the conflict has not led to military engagement, underlying military alliances have played a really important role in how the conflict has developed. The Gulf countries have built military alliances with the US by cooperating in three areas, arms trade, military basing, and counterterrorism. Um, Saudi Arabia is the, the number one importer of US arms in the Middle East. Um, this has created really, really strong ties militarily between the two countries. And Qatar has historically imported most of their arms from France. But starting in 2018, they started increasing a greater and greater number of arms from the United States. Part of the strategy is because they're doing more and more cooperation um, of projects and, and um and exercises with the United States, so they have to have interoperable systems. But another important component of that strategy is tie making ties with the United States in order to solidify greater um, military alliance. Um, in terms of uh, air bases, um, the, the United States used to base a lot of its military in um, Saudi Arabia, but in 23, uh, 2003, when um, the troops were moved, they were brought to uh, to Qatar. And so now there's the al Alid Air Base. And we met with a, a, I believe she was a captain in the Air Force, and she indicated that there was a lot of cooperation between the two countries. Um, and it is, it is now the largest military, US military base in the Middle East. Um, in terms of counterterrorism, Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been kind of uh, Planet jockeying to become closer as a as a better um, ally to the United States in the counterterrorism effort. The U.S. has acknowledged that Qatar has made um, has made progress, especially with signing the MOU and actually allowing a U.S. Treasury employee to sit in the Qatari Central Bank in order to ascertain that the funds are not being um, sent to terrorist organizations, but they recognize the U.S. recognizes that there are still shortcomings and they have concerns about terrorist financing. Saudi Arabia is definitely the the forerunner in this uh, strategic alliance with the United States. Um, Danielle uh, theorized that without the Al Udeid Air Base, that this uh, and the presence of U.S. troops there, this crisis would have played a lot, out a lot differently. The U.S. presence abates fear of Saudi aggression and levels the playing field. This is one reason that the stalemate has not um, has not escalated into military involvement, but it also makes it a lot easier for a stalemate to persist when neither of the sides has any um, imminent fear of violence. Um, the takeaway is that the U.S. has maintained this mil balanced military approach, and as long as it does, um, the stalemate will persist. Um, Dennis's analysis focused on the way the U.S. has contributed to the crisis and the role of U.S. foreign policy of offshore balancing under the Obama administration and how that's played out in regional disputes. Uh, he theorizes that the Arab Spring laid the groundwork for rivalries and that Trump's visit to the Middle East soon after his inauguration was the trigger that lit that crisis. Um, Trump signaled to the quartet while he was um, on his, his visit that the U.S. would not become involved if the quartet took action against Qatar. They took this as the green light from President Trump to try and affect regime change within Qatar. Um, they they believed that they received that support, and then soon thereafter, they um, they took these these actions against Qatar. Um, Dennis further theorizes that the GCT crisis is the beginning of greater regional fragmentation. It's both the cause and the effect of the crisis. As each regional player has exploited the turmoil of the neighbors to create and increase their own influence. 
Qatar is now free to pursue its foreign independent policy as it is no longer beholden to um, diplomatic deference to the, the agendas of the, um, the other quartet countries. And the quartet alliance is beginning to show uh, fissures and areas of incompatibility within it. And so these are some examples of fissures and fragmentation that have begun and they are, they are going to um, increase and become even greater and deeper. So the recommendations um, by uh, kind of the key recommendations by Danielle and Dennis are that the U.S. should use military policy to drive Saudi Arabia and Qatar towards mediation and that they're able to do this because of the leverage they have through the military alliances that we alluded to earlier. Um, and secondly, the military cooperation is a good place to start to improve relations because that's an area of cooperation that has survived better than other areas throughout this crisis. Um, and so if they can unite on areas of shared security concerns, such as um, combating Iranian um, preeminence and combating the spread of ISIS and extremism, then perhaps that is a good place to start uh, in resol resolving their other disputes that they have with one another. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Zeitman, sir. Thank you very much for your reports. Um, let me begin by saying on a personal note that it was a real pleasure for me to go wandering around in the desert with a <laughs> senior colleague and 13 junior colleagues, and we had a very good time uh, together uh, during the whole trip. Uh, as has been suggested, uh, we, the trip started with uh, an even apprehension and uh, even to some extent within a, a, a lack of interest. This was the smallest group of people who volunteered for a trip that we've had in a long time. Uh, uh, and uh, so we came with uh, our minds uh, open and perhaps closed by ideas that we had uh, of what we were going to find. And we soon found out that this is, after all, only a family squabble. I mean, something that I think many of us know in our families. There's this uh, dominant part of the family, been an old uh, uh, ruler uh, or, or chief of the family in charge for a long time. And then uh, there, then up, up comes a, an upstart uh, and wants to go out and do things on his own way. Uh, I'm not going to follow you, Papa. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do things uh, as, as I want to do them. And then, to make matters worse, the dominant part of the family has its own upstart. And so there's a rivalry between the two, uh, and, uh, and that's, that's basically what's, uh, what's going on. Except that then, as we dug further, we realized that uh, these... Uh, this very personal kind of relation um, was uh, 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 represented the head of two and more uh, absolute monarchs, Mo absolute monarchs in absolute monarchies. And this is something that we're not used to finding out, uh, finding um, as we look at international relations. Absolute monarchies are things that are gone for a couple centuries. Putin is absolute, but he's not a monarch. Mohammed VI is a monarch, but he's not absolute. Um, and so this was a, a strange uh, animal that, that we had. And then uh, we soon learned that 87% um, of the population of Qatar is not, has no civic rights uh, and are not citizens. And 30% of the population of Saudi uh, is in the same situation. So a, a quite unusual kind of situation under, these, uh, personal, under this personal leadership. Um, but then as we dug deeper, too, we discovered that uh, this was not something new, although, in fact, on both sides, uh, within these monarchies, the two sides are trying to competitively modernize, um, and competitively modernize and not, uh, not pay, give recognition to the efforts of the other to do uh, modernization. And, and so in, within their populations, uh, this is very much welcomed. The heads are heading in a modern direction, but the feet are in the sands of tradition. So, uh, but as I said, we, we uh, soon discovered that this was uh, bigger than these two or three countries um, uh, in this area of the world. Um, and in fact, it represents a rival, rivalry that has been going on since the time of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, and the Wahhabis uh, in the peninsula. Uh, so there's a historic depth uh, that we had to take into account as well. And then finally, as we looked around beyond this, we saw that uh, 
that it's not simply something that's limited to the region that we have visited, but it's something like a, a, a hydra that sp uh, spreads its tentacles throughout the whole area in Libya, uh, in uh, uh, Syria, um, in Djibouti, um, in uh, uh, Yemen, uh, and then, of course, in relation to Iran as well. So uh, we learned that there was a lot more than uh, just a family squabble. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, open the floor to Q&A. Um, please. Uh, does the fact that uh, Dubai is hosting the World Expo 2020 next year going to influence any of your plans? Is no, uh, anyone want to take that one? Who wrote about 2022? No, no, not 2020. 20. Expo 2020. Oh, Expo 2020. I was mishearing. Uh, no, I... Why don't you take a couple of questions? We'll take a couple of questions. Others? Please. Uh, I have a limited knowledge of this based on public, uh, public sources, but I recall at the beginning of the crisis that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef opposed the decision... Um, the, to this, the whole strategy of the Qatar blockade. And shortly thereafter, he was replaced by uh, MBS. And so I was wondering if on the trip there was any indication that the motivation for the Saudi policy was internal power politics rather than international, uh, international concerns. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes. <laughs> so... So I highlight the, the the aspects between the internal. I don't know. Is it working? You can. So that's that's a very good question, and you're correct that there is an internal power struggle going on because this is a generational. First time since the founding ruler of modern Saudi Arabia. And Mohammed bin Nayef was originally the crown prince, and he was pushed out by King Salman, and he ended up putting his own son, MBS, in power. So, the, I mean, short answer to your question yes, it is more of an internal power struggle, in my opinion, that is it's like going back to the argument of domestic politics. So I think a lot of it derives from that. And it's about MBS uh, gaining legitimacy, his own legitimacy within his own country. Does that answer your question? We've got one right behind you there. Um, I had a question just for Rebecca. You seem to focus particularly on political Islam and kind of how the conflict. Can you is. speak up? Uh, put it, put it in the microphone. Yeah, right in there. Okay. That's much better. Um, okay. So in in terms of uh, what you had talked about, Rebecca, you focus more on political Islam, and I was wondering if you can comment on the role the UAE had, and particularly Mohammed bin Zayed, and how you thought the UAE was involved in the conflict, and uh, who you thought might have been. Um, the main driver of imposing the, the blockade or embargo, whatever you call it, either the UAE or the kingdom? Uh, yeah, so I think one of the things that we, we heard from um, outsiders was that uh, the UAE was, was the brains of the operation uh, where Saudi Arabia was the muscle. Um, and I, I think there's a large degree of truth in that. And as far as uh, political Islam and, and the Muslim Brotherhood go, um, certainly this is a line that uh, the UAE have, have pushed um, much more than, than Saudi. Um, there's been, a, I mean, they were, they were the first to, to crack down on the Muslim Brotherhood in the region. Um, someone else we spoke to said there had been a kind of element of McCarthyism uh, towards the organization in the UAE. Um, I mean, I think it's it's important to stress that the UAE is, I mean, we all tend to kind of think about Dubai, um, but of the, the seven emirates, um, some of them are, are significantly more um, conservative. 
Um, and so there's been a kind of push from some of the more conservative uh, Emirates to um, uh, to um, move towards a kind of more uh, conservative policy uh, within the whole um, within the whole of the UAE. So so yeah, I think it's uh, the UAE have definitely played an important role. Let me take two this time the way I said I would. Uh, one there and one here. Uh, you characterize this as a non-hurting stalemate, and one of the recommendations I saw was for U.S. mediation. And my question to the uh, idea of U.S. mediation is, uh, why would it be in the U.S. interest to put pressure on either of its allies in the region, essentially making it the U.S. would make it a hurting stalemate. Why is it in the U.S. interest to make this a hurting stalemate if it uh, damages its own relations with either country? And if it's not going to put pressure, what does the U.S. have in terms of enticing leverage to bring the parties to the table? Another one? Um, uh, my question is about the 2022 World Cup. Um, so Qatar has actually received a lot of negative media backlash in the international community. Um, I wanted to know if they addressed that and if you got the chance to talk to any just everyday Qataris and how they feel about hosting the, the event. Thank you. Sarah, you want to refer your, the question about the U.S. to, is it Sabiha? Who? Oh, it was Jasmine, sorry. I can speak to that uh, question, Ross. So, um, so as, as we briefly discussed, I think this kind of goes into both what Ashley and Sarah had uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, so in terms of the U.S. interest to get involved, the U.S. sees the whole of the GCC region um, in the Persian Gulf as almost their way of, um, uh, I guess, fighting against Iranian uh, descendancy. And as we see that Trump had moved into the office, you know, he repealed or he repealed the um, Iranian nuclear war, uh, nuclear deal, sorry, um, I'm sorry? Okay, yes. Um, so we see that the U.S. has taken a more um, regressive approach, um, and they fear, they fear that uh, Iran, um, as the blockade occurs, that Qatar will get closer to Iran. Uh, they, fear that, they fear that that would be a possibility. Um, and, you know, especially with the oil trade that they have with that region, um, it's definitely in, within the U.S.'s interest to maintain um, cohesion within the region um, in order to maintain that free trade, um, sorry, not free trade, in, in order to maintain that strong trade they have with that region. Um, and then as Ashley had referred earlier, um, there is a heavy U.S. military footprint in the region, so they would use that as a pressure point um, in order to, uh, I guess, uh, dissolve that uh, dispute. And the other question about was about World take, Cup. Take that one. Rebecca? Um, yeah, so actually we had a, a meeting with the head of the Qatari World Cup, which was uh, really interesting. Um, he uh, admitted a lot of the, the criticism. Um, and I think it's, it's probably fair to say that um, we got very much the standard line. I mean, he said that there had been improvements in terms of workers' rights and things like that, but I... I think it's it's definitely something that we should have a kind of healthy degree of uh, skepticism about. Uh, in terms of whether Qataris themselves are uh, excited about the event, so I think definitely before the, the crisis, um, uh, people were not so enthusiastic about it. Um, and I think it's important to note that Qatari society is very, very conservative. Um, and so obviously the, the sort of things that you normally associate with the World Cup, uh, such as the, you know, fans and heavy drinking on the streets and things like this. I mean, this is certainly a concern uh, to Qataris. Um, but I think after the, um, the, the crisis, um, there's been a lot more support for it. I mean, again, I think in, in line with this kind of uh, increased uh, national identity, that, that people are much more supportive of it. Um, and just to give you an anecdote as well, I actually asked him um, when we were there sort of how he was going to kind of square the circle of a kind of very conservative society uh, hosting, um, you know, potentially a, uh, 
a raucous World Cup, um, and his response was that, well, hopefully England don't qualify. So. <laughs> Professor Sabin. Yeah, I'm sorry, the guy with the uh, Global Ex uh, World Expo uh, question has gone, but um, uh, both the, the, the World Cup and the World Expo are the kind of things that can make uh, parties in the embargo uh, think twice about some of the details, uh, and do they want to pursue this to the end, and so there's a chance of this changing the situation, they're not going to back out immediately, but they can make exceptions for various things, like, for example, for the Hajj, uh, and for a, a back and forth in, in the two global uh, uh, instances. Um, in addition, the World Cup um, is likely to be uh, involved new uh, teams being allowed to come in, which puts a ta which taxes the uh, even the the large uh, installations that the uh, the Qatari are are putting together, and so uh, it, it may be uh, there was some discussion of part of the World Cup going to the Emirates, um, and that too would would be the kind of thing that would change the situation and and uh, let some light into the, the the hard positions on either side. On the, the hurting stalemate, um, uh, no, it's not a hurting stalemate, as we've said all the way down the line to the parties, but it's a hurting stalemate to the United States because with these two parties, they're, both of them are friends. We have to keep good relations. Whenever we do good relations to one side, that's offensive to the other and, and vice versa. So uh, the United States would like, and uh, General Zini was asked to, to make some mediation and and. and I, I don't like to say failed, it was impossible to get the two sides to, to listen to each other. Uh, but uh, the United States is interested in, in making peace, as happens frequently with mediation. I think we should note that the Qataris, so that there is this potential for the World Cup to somehow help. Uh, the Qataris were very much opposed to that idea. They do not want to share the World Cup with the Emirates. Uh, so even even in that issue, the the conflict may be too big for them. the conflict continues. Uh, I I would also add that um, one thing I was very struck by was that as much money as Qatar is spending on the World Cup preparations, it's spending uh, more than ten times as much on infrastructure, uh, mainly for Doha, and. Uh, also in Riyadh, you see an enormous amount of construction, this new, new mass transit system going in. These people, these absolute monarchs, are really competing on the modernization front. They both want to be known as the leading modernizers in the Gulf, and uh, uh, that's not the worst aspect of things in some respects, uh, but it is... It, it makes you feel sometimes like you're in a hall of mirrors, that, that there's no end of reflection of one in the other mirror. Other questions? Please. Thank you. We've seen clear indications of social tightening in Saudi Arabia, prosecution of female activists, et cetera. Uh, I'm wondering if you're seeing anything like this in Qatar as well, a clamping down on any space for the minimum amount of, of, di of any kind of difference of opinion from what the government has expressed, and also the sort of impact on, of the, the public relations efforts within the region. Is anybody getting more traction than the others, or, or is it just sort of entrenched? And one more. Back there, Jeffrey Pugh. Hi, so uh, Rebecca mentioned in the presentation uh, the use of culture for political aims, I think drawing on Julia's report, and I wonder if we can unpack that a little bit. Um, Qatar has this very powerful tool in Al Jazeera to shape the narrative in the region and um, to advance certain cultural frames more than others, um, but that sounded like that was also a core part of the conflict, that that was very high on the list of demands of um, changing the way that happens. On the Saudi side, how does the sort of shaping of culture work? Do they have tools um, to push back in, in the other direction um, in 
ways that could compete with Al Jazeera. What is Saudi doing to try to um, advance particular narratives, frames, shape culture, shape children's education um, in a way that serves their interest in the conflict? Uh, Julia, you want to take that one on, what we think about the Saudi and Qatari social control questions? I can also speak briefly to the social control question, I guess. Um, just by mentioning that there, there is the possibility of elections coming forward, at least on more of like a local level in Qatar in the future, and that is a possibility that we raised in several of our meetings. So our impression was not necessarily that there's the same level of, say, repression against speaking up in Qatar that there is in Saudi Arabia. What we got instead was the official line that nobody is unhappy because everyone is rich. <laughs> so, which, to be fair, I don't think I would believe in many other countries, but there is something to that statement when you realize that Qatar is paying basically all of its citizens um, a certain amount of money whenever they get married so that they can like build a house. Qatar is paying so that all of its citizens can go to college and get an education. So there is something to be said for that wealth and how it is maybe not making civil society necessarily rise up in the same way that we might expect in a different cultural context. And then just on the note of Al Jazeera and how Saudi Arabia is competing with it, first of all, I just wanted to note that Al Jazeera is not available in Saudi Arabia. It's banned even in like hotels. So basically the narrative that Qatar is trying to sell on Saudi Arabia is not necessarily widely available within Saudi Arabia itself. Um, so that was something interesting that I didn't know going into this. Uh, and then we did meet with a newspaper in Riyadh that I'm not sure if anyone else wants to speak to, but is, you know, selling their own narrative, essentially. So there's media being used to disperse the Saudi narrative within Saudi Arabia, and then outside of Saudi, I'd say, again, it's money that's speaking with investments across the region and the world, um, which is being used to sell, again, the narrative of either Saudi or Qatar being more of a modernizing nation. Uh, so we can take a look and see that competition in a lot of spheres. But for instance, in Lebanon, Saudi Arabia was offering huge amounts of money for something. And when they pulled out, Qatar decided to go in and take over. So you can see investment, you can see, again, lobbying in the US, there are vast amounts of money being used to try and convince the US government in particular which narrative is correct, which country is best, which country is light, which country is dark, et cetera. Yeah. Anyone else on uh, these issues? Ashley? I was, I was just going to add to um, the commentary on the public relations campaign. Um, it's pretty widely accepted that so, that um, that Saudi Arabia won, no, I'm sorry, that Qatar won the PR war in the United States. Um, they've always had a big uh, PR arm here, and Qatar did uh, up the number of people that they had and the, the pressure that was put on. And so it, both sides recognized, Saudi recognized, that they had lost the PR war. Yes. That was a huge component of it. That certainly hung over the trip. Uh, and we talked about it in Saudi Arabia. Uh, maybe I'll add a word about the social control issue. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, there is a very strong conviction that the reforms are real, at least among the people we were talking to who are people close to the government, but not necessarily right in the center of it. And they're very frightened by the, uh, what they perceive as the international threat to Mohammed bin Salman. He's the head sheikh, and uh, he is also the guy who has chased the religious conservatives from their impregnable position of power. And so they're very frightened that he might fall. And they say it very explicitly that they're willing to uh, 
sacrifice some freedoms for stability. Now, that's probably not true of everybody in Saudi Arabia, certainly not of the women who are being arrested. On the arrests, I talked, uh, we, we visited the Human Rights Commission, I talked with people extensively about it. The line that they were using is the line that has now become public, which is that the women are arrested not for protesting the ban on driving, but for their illicit relations with international forces unidentified. Uh, that's become a public line now. I think uh, the Saudis are also doing something. They have a reconciliation committee that we visited. And the reconciliation committee, I, I'm scratching my head, What's, what does Saudi Arabia need reconciliation? They're all kind of the same, aren't they? Well, no, not really, they're not. And they emphasize that very clearly in this reconciliation commission, which has a little museum set up to teach about tolerance and, and dialogue and, all, and reconciliation, all the good things in life that high, junior high school, high school students are supposed to be visiting, and which we visited as well. And it was very striking. This is clearly intended uh, in part as a countering violent extremism uh, uh, effort, an effort to, uh, to strengthen Saudi as opposed to sectarian identity. Um, uh, in Qatar, the fact of the matter is that in Qatar, uh, the need for control <clears throat> seems to be much less. And uh, having been there a number of times, I know that Qataris speak very freely on a one-on-one -on -one basis. What they don't do is go out in public challenging the politics of, of the emirate. It's, it's just not, it's not done. Uh, so you have, uh, they are absolute monarchies, or at least the closest you can get to an absolute monarchy uh, in this modern world. And what that means in terms of behavior is quite different, I would say, in the two places. Other questions? Please, in back and up here. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious about internet use. I'm sure, I'm sure both of you tried, all of you tried to use the internet while you were in both countries. How free or restrictive was it and compare the two countries? One more. Uh, there was one right down here. Two and, quick questions. Uh, one, did anyone raise the impolitic question about uh, MBS's involvement with the uh, dismemberment of a post uh, uh, journalist? And two, uh, are the Qataris really socialists since Bernie Sanders would approve of uh, <laughs> married couples getting paid to build a house and also sending all their children to college for it? I might approve too. Uh, <laughs> Let's take one more back here, and then we'll, we'll be wrapping up. Thank you. Uh, we've seen uh, Bahrain's uh, status, financial status, go on to junk uh, investment status by um, all the major creditors. I'm wondering, is, did you detect any angst or any worry within Saudi Arabia or Qatar that their social model of spending big and giving lots of money to their citizens um, and relying on um, the price of oil or LNG isn't sustainable. Thank you. Let's start with that one, Ashley. Um, the unsustainability of LNG was not something that was acknowledged, um, certainly not from the Qatari side. Uh, however, the, the fact that they have been trying to diversify their economy uh, and their dom the domestic production um, indicates that there is concern there. Uh, and so they have been working to try and um, make sure, limit the amount of GDP that is attributed just to LNG. Anybody on the internet? I detected no restrictions on the internet. Uh, nothing like Damascus in 2008, for example, where we, you would get warnings that you couldn't go to certain sites all the time. Uh, I didn't detect anything. Did anybody else? 
on, uh, on Jamal. Uh, who wants to take that one? Rebecca? Yeah, um, so as Professor um, Sura mentioned, uh, it definitely came up in meetings. Um, we actually had a, a meeting at the Saudi Foreign Ministry and um, met with Al Jubair, who dealt with the, the fallout from that. Um, he was surprisingly open about it and, and spoke um, a lot about uh, sort of the, the after events. Um, he was quite critical of, of Turkey's uh, withholding of information and intelligence. Um, everyone that we met uh, expressed sympathy, um, but it was definitely portrayed as a, um, a sort of either a tragic accident that something just went very wrong or that these were rogue elements um, and certainly um, no one that we met with implied that MBS had anything to do with it. Um, on the uh, Qatari um, socialist uh, side, I just, I mean, <laughs> I mean, no. Um, I, but I think, I mean, it's a very, Qatar is a very visibly wealthy society. Um, there's a lot of bling. Um, so I think that in, in itself kind of goes against the, the socialist model that I think at least I'm aware of. Anybody else on those issues? I was just going to add um, regarding Khashoggi, the killing. Um, when we were speaking to students, uh, off the record, very candidly, they were the most zealous uh, advocates of MBS. And they said that if they found out unequivocally that MBS did have something to do with it, that even they, as these staunch advocates, would desert him and uh, no longer support him. Now, confirmation bias would lead them never to believe that there was unequivocal evidence of his involvement, but they did say that that was a red line for them. Yes, I think that was the general attitude, actually, that, that if that were true, that passes the red line for all Saudis, but therefore it can't be true. Uh, it's frustrating, but you have to listen to people, and these people were telling us, look, the reforms depend on MBS, and we think the reforms are serious, and we don't want to give them up. And that, that was a, a, a strongly felt view among the Saudis. Uh, the Qataris, by the way, I would add one point. Somebody mentioned elections. Julia mentioned elections. The Qataris, actually, Qatar formally is a constitutional monarchy. It uh, is an absolute monarchy because the constitution has never been implemented. But they have promised elections, this year or next. And the question that the people in Qatar, not only Qataris, but also the foreign professors are asking is, are these elections, how do we prevent the elections from being a tribal census, because the current emir doesn't favor the, the, the larger tribes. In fact, his advisors are mainly from smaller tribes, we were told. So if you hold elections, and the, the major tribe, if people vote according to tribe, and that, that happens in a lot of places, and I don't know any reason it wouldn't happen in Qatar, uh, it, it, it could actually make the current system less inclusive rather than more inclusive. And you have to consider that as a very serious possibility. That, uh, so people were puzzled about that, including the, the Western professors who teach there. They didn't know what to do about that. And uh, you know, I, had, I have my doubts that the elections will actually come off. But if they do, they do have to figure out how to prevent this kind of tribal census. Other final remarks? Professor Zartman. You know, it's interesting when you come back from a trip like this, you, <clears throat> you wonder what uh, the, the balance sheet is and who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. And I haven't taken a pool, poll among our, uh, my junior colleagues or senior colleague either. But um, I think that uh, I sense that the uh, outcome of our judgment is that uh, 
the two sides deserve each other. <laughs> and both of them deserve our sympathy as they go through, our empathy, let's say, as they go through an extremely difficult time uh, in modern socio-political life. Um, some of which their things they're doing are not friendly to us, but uh, uh, still it's a big challenge. Ashley, anything to add? No, that's it. Sarah, Rebecca, I'm good. any of the other students? A last question, because I hear dinner being set up in the next room. Well, let's adjourn then, and let me express my appreciation. <laughs> A particular vote of appreciation to our audience, and also to Isabel Talpain Long, <laughs> without whom these things just wouldn't happen. Thank you, Isabel. <laughs>